see everyone. We're during a very auspicious time on the Jewish calendar, known as the 10 days of returning to God between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Very holy days on the Jewish calendar, and a very appropriate time for tonight's subject. The holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur, the focus is on one word, and that is forgiveness. But our rabbis tell us, that we can only seek forgiveness from God on Yom Kippur. Forgiveness from our fellow man can only be granted by our fellow man. We cannot come to God and say we're sorry for the things we've done to others. For those matters, we have to turn to one another and seek each other's forgiveness. And this is the week that in Jewish tradition we have to think of who we may have offended, who we may have harmed, who we may have insulted or slighted intentionally, unintentionally, and actually reach out to them during this week before Yom Kippur and ask for their forgiveness. On the other hand, we're told in Jewish tradition that if someone asks you for forgiveness sincerely and wholeheartedly, the Jewish way is to be kind-hearted and to relieve them of the burden of guilt that if they're sincere, you should grant them forgiveness. And our tradition tells us that you're only responsible to ask for forgiveness three times. If you ask a person three times for forgiveness, sincerely, genuinely, on three different occasions, and they reject you all of those three times, Jewish tradition tells us that the sin is now upon the person who refuses to forgive. Because that is not the Jewish way. The Jewish way is to be forgiving, compassionate, and understanding. This is a very... There's a reason why the holiest day of the year on the Jewish calendar is devoted to forgiveness. I believe it's because it's the most difficult thing to ask for sometimes and the most difficult thing to grant sometimes. And that's why we need 24 hours of prayer and faster to deal with this issue. And as a rabbi, I see firsthand the pain that's caused sometimes in families, in friendships, in communities when people are unable to ask or to grant forgiveness. And so what better time than this week as we head towards Yom Kippur on Friday night than to hear a lecture on this subject of the art of forgiveness. And so I asked myself who would be the most suitable person to deliver this lecture. And Rabbi Tao is actually here for the first time at Palm Beach Synagogue, which is which is unusual because we've had most of the great Jewish thinkers, speakers, writers at the synagogue over the past 20 years, as you know. But uh, he's written some remarkable books and he writes a weekly column in a magazine called Ami Magazine. And he's really gained a tremendous reputation as being a spiritual healer, someone who understands the pathways of the soul and can help bridge and mend fences and create healing and understanding, and especially deal with painful subjects. Primarily, he's well known in the, his work and his book on the area of the subject of the 12-step program of addictions. And the beautiful thing about Rabbi Tao is that it's not just the subject for him, but it's something he lives every day and deals with these matters on a daily basis. And you'll see that after his lecture, he's not gonna run off. He'll stick around and he'll be available to talk to you one-on-one -on -one because he's not here just to deliver a lecture. He's here to make himself available to help people. And he even told me that when people request, he not only gives out his email, but also gives out his phone number. Because if this is something that is a passion of his, and just to give him a formal introduction, Rabbi Shays Tao is an internationally known speaker, writer, and teacher on topics of Jewish spirituality. He was also known for his work in the field of addiction recovery. NPR dubbed him an expert in Jewish mysticism in the 12 steps. The New York Times called him a phenomenon. His best-selling book, God of Our Understanding, Jewish Spirituality and Recovery from Addiction, was a number one Jewish bestseller on Amazon.com and was praised by Publishers Weekly as a single resource for those in need. He is a leading exponent of the fundamental Hasidic text Tanya and created two groundbreaking works on the book, The Map of Tanya and the JLI Course Soul Maps. He is a frequent and popular contributor to the Huffington Post. He also writes a weekly advice column for Ami Magazine. It's truly a joy and a pleasure to welcome to our community Rabbi Shays Tal.
You hear me? Good? Yeah. yeah. I'm uh, sort of taken aback by the crowd. You know that uh, Yom Kippur is coming up Friday night, right? <laughs> We're all going to be back in shul again, all over again. Okay, just, just make me sure. Okay. It's a busy time. It's a busy time to be Jewish. <laughs> For rabbis, it's the busiest time. I gotta tell you, this is like, it's like tax season for an accountant business. <laughs> <laughs> there was once a rabbi who prepared all summer his uh, Yom Kippur sermon, the Kol Nidre speech he's gonna give. You know, that's the big night when you see people you don't see all year. A lot of times, you, know, you have it for once a year or two, you see people you don't normally see. It's always the question, what do you do as a rabbi when you see somebody who doesn't show up on a Monday night for a lecture. You know, they, uh, you only see them for, for uh, Yom Kippur, you only see them in Kol It's one time a rabbi decided he's gonna be a little bit forward and he, uh, there was a guy, decided he's gonna approach him. So as Kol Nidre was ending, the rabbi cut the guy off sort of at the pass. Standing at the, the front doors as the guy was leaving, he says to him, he says, Phil, you know, we're here 365 days a year for your whatever Jewish needs you have, and it's not only on Yom Kippur. And uh, Phil says, Rabbi, you're a nice guy, I'm not going to lie to you, but I find synagogue extremely tedious and boring. I mean, I can only come once a year, and that's about as much as I can take it. Every time you come, it's the same exact thing over and over. Kol nidre, kol nidre, kol nidre. <laughs> One time this rabbi was uh, on the way to Kol Nidre services and he had his, his sermon written up and he was about to uh, deliver the sermon. He's leaving the house and uh, as he walks out the threshold of the front door, he sees an envelope lying on the front, the stoop in front of the front door. He picks it up. Envelope's not marked, it's not sealed. He, he opens it up, there's a paper inside, fold it up. He opens the paper. And on the paper, left there at the rabbi's front step, right there, you know, as he's walking to Kol Nidre to see his flock, the biggest, biggest night of the year, and to deliver the biggest sermon of the year, and he gets this envelope on his front porch, and he opens it up, the one, one word, just one word is scrawled in jagged letters across the paper. It just says, Schmendrick. <laughs> you know, this is, here he is, a rabbi preparing, the big knife, he gets this note on his door, Schmendrick, you know. So he, he picks it up and stuffs it in his pocket, and he walks into shul, he walks past the big crowd, he walks right up to the, the bima, and he walks up there, and he, and he gets up to, to his place, and he, and he, and he, faces, he looks at all the faces, he knows that probably the guy who wrote the Schmendrick is one of the people in the crowd, and he gets up there, he says, you know, my friends, my, my, my congregants, I had this whole speech prepared, and the Kol Nidre sermon, but I have to address something before I do. I, there's something that's, that's weighing on me. When I left the house just five minutes ago, there was an envelope at my front door, and I opened it up, and there was just there was one page inside the envelope with just one word scrawled in jagged letters across the page. Just, just it's a schmendrick. And, and I don't know what to make of this because in all my years as a rabbi, I received a lot of letters without signatures. This is the first time I received a signature without a letter. <laughs> the moral of that story is that you cannot be offended unless you choose to be. When somebody does wrong to us, that's their choice. <clears throat> How we take it, that's our choice. I can't choose your behaviors. I can't choose your words and your actions. You're, you're gonna choose them, and you're gonna be accountable for them. It's none of my business. 
But I can choose my reactions. I can choose how I take it. And that's what I want to talk about tonight, about, uh, I guess what I want to talk about is our true selves, about our real, about the real you. You know, each one of us is a soul that came to this world born at a certain time and place to a certain man and woman to live a certain amount of hours and minutes and seconds. And each one of us has a unique mission in life that nobody else can fulfill. And we're here to live that mission, show up for that, for that, for that life. And uh, the, the victim role does not allow us to show up for our own lives. It's a script. It's not an authentic script. It's, a, it's, a, it's an act. It's not the real me. And until I get over it, I'm not going to show up for my own life. I mean, I'm here, I'm present, but you know what it's like when someone's present, but they're not really here. Right? Okay. And we can do that for our own lives. We can be present, going through the motions, um, but not really here not really available. There was a great, pious, holy sage, his name was Reb Zushya, he was one of the students of the Magid. The Magid was the chief disciple and the successor of the Baal Shem Tov. And on his deathbed, Reb Zushya was crying, and his students were around him, and they said, Reb, why are you crying? He says, I fear judgment. They said, why are you fear judgment? You live the life of perfect piety and purity, and if you fear judgment, that doesn't bode too well for us. And he said, my children, you have to understand. I'm not afraid I'll get to the heavenly court, and they'll look at my life, and they'll look at me, and they'll say, Zushia, why weren't you like Abraham, our father? I'm not afraid they're going to look at my life and look at me and say, Zushia, why weren't you like Moshe Rabbeinu, like Moses, our teacher? I'm concerned they may look at me, they may look at my life, and they may say, Zushia, why weren't you like Zushia? You know, sometimes when somebody is on the pity pot and they're being overly uh, remorseful, resentful, wallowing, self-pity, and we tell them, come on, get a life. I mean, if you're their real friend, we tell them, come on, get a, get a life. I don't think that's specific enough. I think we <laughs> get a life. <laughs> now, preferably your own. Your life. Some of us have life, and it's not our own. It's a script, it's a role. Living for others, not being true to ourselves. And on Yom Kippur, the way atonement works is that. Um, we have an opportunity to become ourselves again. The real me. My soul. And when I return to that essence, I return to a place that's so pristine and so pure, like, like a newborn baby, and sin can't even touch that place. And all the hurt goes away. Everything goes away, and I just become renewed reborn. But I can't really let that happen, or I can't be in tune with it happening if I'm still holding on to my shtick. And so, on the holiest day of the year, on Yom Kippur, when God sets the reset button, I say kol nidre, all vows. What does the prayer of an annulling, annulling of vow have to do with being atoned for and being reborn and being renewed? I once heard an interesting explanation. There are many, but this is one, and I think it's appropriate to the subject tonight, and I want to share it with you. All vows. If I have made a promise to myself, that I will never be able to get over that. Now that ruined my life. That thing, 
No, that's just too, too much. If I've made a commitment that because of, you know, that liability that I have, you know, that that will always be a sore spot for me. I, I don't have the right to be happy because of that thing. If I've made all these commitments to myself, and usually they're commitments that I made long, long ago. These are old hurts. These are old scripts. I might have made this uh, promise as an 18-year-old, and I'm living with it as a 40-year-old. Um, make promises to ourselves from the five and, and you can be living with it at, at 85. And I have the right on the holiest of all days when I'm being returned to my true essence and being wiped fresh and clean, I get to tell my 18 year old self, I'm sorry, I don't have to keep that promise to you. You said you'll never get over it. Well, I say we will. I don't have any commitment here. I don't owe it to anyone to be remorseful, to be devastated, to be crippled by this thing that I said I would be crippled by when it happened. When it happened, I felt that way. Okay, that was my reaction at the time. I don't have to feel bad now because I felt bad then. I'm under no such commitment. Kol Nidre, I want to absolve myself of these vows. You know, there's an expression, would you rather be right or would you rather be happy? A lot of times people say, eh, I'd rather be right. <laughs> and you grow up a little bit and you become more mature and you realize, you know, what's the point of having the moral high ground? It stinks to have the moral high ground. Righteous indignation didn't make me happy. It didn't make me more productive. It didn't add to my mission here on earth. It took me away from life, it took me away from people, it took me away from relationships, it took me away from everything that matters. I don't need moral high ground, I don't need righteous indignation. I don't need to be right. So if you made a promise to yourself at some juncture in your life that you would rather be right than be happy, call me today, I'm absolving myself of that now. It's okay, I can be wrong. But I guess I want to talk about how we do that. And in a word, forgiveness is faith. Forgiveness Letting go of those grudges and resentments and those old wounds that we have from other people is about um, getting in touch with our relationship with God. So I was saying before, I'm not the real me as long as I'm playing the victim. That when, I, when am I the real me? I'm, I'm the real me when I'm showing up for my special God-given mission. When Zushia is being Zushia. When Chase is being Chase. Whoever you are, you're being the real you. Being the real you means living according to your purpose. your God-given purpose, your mission. I think there's a misunderstanding, and I'm going to take a step away from talking about forgiveness for a moment, but I hope you'll trust me that this, uh, this is a necessary digression. I think there's a big misunderstanding about what is the formula for happiness, what gives us a happy life. Um, there was once a story that happened back in Russia it was a very talented young man. He was a Hasidic young man. And he went to a private audience with his Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe of Chabad, the first Chabad Rebbe, Rebbe Shnei Zalman. And he went to Lajne. Lajne was a town in, in White Russia. And he had his one-on-one, -on -one, his private audience. 
and this very capable, talented young man had a list. You know that list we all have of like why my life stinks, right? So he had that list. Like, right? and if you know, if I could check off everything on that list, then I would have a good life. And so he came into his Rebbe with that list, and and, and he gave it to his Rebbe, and he, he asked basically for a blessing for for happiness, and. His rabbi told him, "Du redst as I feel, wegen was du darfst, aber was bedarf man dir?" Yata. You speak a lot about what you need, but what do you need it for? Now he wasn't trying to be dismissive. He wasn't trying to say, "Oh, don't cry," you know, man up. It was a compassionate, it was the most compassionate answer. It was bubble You want to be happy? I want you to be happy more than you want to be happy. I want you to be happy more than you want you to be happy. You understand? But you're going about it the wrong way. You're under the misimpression, I guess most of us are, that this list of stuff that you don't have is standing in between you and your happiness. And if you'll be able to check it all off and fill all these things in, ah, then you'll be happy and it don't work that way. You, you speak a lot about what you need, but what do you need it for? That's the secret of happiness, to know what you need it for. We can put it in psychological terms. I think Viktor Frankl said in Man's Search for Meaning, he said that happiness is not something you can pursue, it's something that has to ensue. And it's the happy byproduct of living a life of meaning. So in other words, you can't chase it, you can't run it down. It's not about getting your needs met, it's about being a person who is needed. And that means knowing why God created you and having the sensitivity to live up to that. To be a useful human being, to be a helpful human being, to live for others. Don't worry about your needs. God is giving you everything you need, and if you don't have it, that's the best proof you don't need it. For now. <laughs> So my life is about a mission. Life is about purpose. You know, life is more than just existing. It's more than just taking up space. Life is mission, is purpose, <coughs> meaning. My meaning has to do with what I contribute, not what you do to me. What a passive, what a victim way of defining a life. My life is defined by what you do to me. That's my life. My life has nothing to do with what you do to me. My life has to do with the choices I make. You know, it's the difference between being a thermometer and a thermostat. There's thermometer people and there's thermostat people. A thermometer person is reactive. However, the environment is treating him, that's how he feels. A real victim, really passive. And a thermostat gets up in the morning and says, My daddy lefanecha, I hereby acknowledge and give grateful thanks to you, living in eternal king, for giving me my, my soul back, giving me another day here, reporting for duty, sir. And he puts his setting on Simcha, <laughs> and that's where he's at all day, and that's the temperature he's emitting into his environment. Thermostat person. We used to have this real funny bus driver when I was a kid. He made the same corny joke a thousand times. Every single time someone would get off the bus, he'd say, hey, have yourself a great day, unless you've got other plans. I was once invited to speak at a place called Gilda's Club. It's named after Gilda Radner, Allah Hashem. She was a very talented young Jewish woman. She died of ovarian cancer. Her husband, also a Jew, Gene Wilder, made the foundation in her memory, Gilda's Club. It's a support group. It's a place that programs and support for people with various forms of cancer. And uh, it's an incredibly um, important cause. And this was many years ago when I was a young rabbi. I know many of you are thinking you are a young rabbi. No, I was a really young rabbi. 
<laughs> I had no white whatsoever in my beard. I would think I was in my 20s. And uh, I was invited to speak at Gilda's Club. By the way, just I'm having flashbacks right now. One time, this is a great crowd, by the way. This is a fan. I, I know, I want to tell you, this is a great crowd. And I know all, all stand up comedians say that. <laughs> by the way, I got to tell you something. I was once speaking, actually not far from it, it was in Boca Raton. It was at a, at a recovery chabaton. And uh, so I spoke Friday night, gave you know, my rabbi lecture, and then after me, there was this comedian who came out. So there was a lady who was there with her father. Her father was elderly and he was getting tired, so he heard me speak. And then he said, it's time, I gotta, I gotta go to sleep. I gotta go. It was in a hotel, so I gotta go back to the room, I gotta go to sleep. So his daughter says, you know, after hearing me speak, you know, he's tired, he wants to go back there. So she says to him, but hold on, don't you want to hear the comedian? And he says, no, no, he was very good. <laughs> So I said, wow, that's the best, that's the best compliment I could ever get. Okay, so what was I talking about? Oh yeah, this is a great crowd. Palm Beach, all right. I am in Palm Beach, right? Okay. I don't know. Last night I was in Great Neck. And yeah, someone here from Great Neck. All right, Long Island, okay. Huh? From the south shore, not from the north shore? What? Oh, you're in the south side of Great Neck. Okay, which is the better so we know the superior side. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the north side is better. <laughs> are you from the north side of Great Neck or are you yes. just on the. Okay, you are, okay. You're not just picking a fight for the fun. Okay. There's New York Jews here in this audience? <laughs> Okay, at any rate. Um, what? Oh yeah, yeah, I know where I'm at. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry, this is what I get paid for. Do not forget where I uh, left off. What was I saying? Okay. So, yeah. No, but I was saying this is a great crowd. I remember one time I was telling this story and to me, it's a very moving story. It had a big impression on me. Um, but I'm telling the story, and I'm saying, Gilda Radner, Gene Wilder, and some clown in the back row, and it was a big crowd, it was maybe like 100 people, and it was a big room, and in the back of the crowd, some guy screams out, Willy Wonka! <laughs> and it threw me off. That did throw me off. Uh, yeah, so what did you say? Like, I couldn't even go on it. Sometimes you ignore it, but so what did you say? He said, Willy Wonka. Oh yeah, okay. Gene Wilder, Willy Wonka, so you have to say. I said, listen, do me a favor. A little respect. We're in short. Okay? It's the Frisco kid. The Frisco kid. <laughs> Frisco kid. Okay. All right. Um so they invited me to come speak on the topic of faith in the face of adversity. I pull up in front of Gilda's Club and I think to myself, you know, I was a young rabbi, so I had a little bit of chutzpah more than I have today, but also enough sense to realize that maybe this was not a good idea. And it, it occurred to me as I'm pulling up in front of Gilda's Club, I'm going to give a talk called Faith in the Face of Adversity to a room full of people who have cancer. No, I'm not going to do that. So I was basically, I'm thinking, I'm just, I'm, I'm going to call in, I'm going to apologize. It. And as I pull up in front, I'm pulling up in front of the building. And the lady who ran the place was this real type A personality. So she was already buzzing around out front with her clipboard, like five minutes before I was supposed to be there. She sees me pull up. And she walks right up to my car. So at this point, she's standing in front of my car. So the only, the only way to escape at this point is to run her over <laughs> or leave the keys running and just flee on foot. So I decided neither of those were good options. So I just, I said, I, I unrolled the window and I said, yeah, hi. She says, okay, Rabbi, let's go. Crowd's waiting. 
So uh, I turn off the car, I get out of the get out of the car, I close the door, and I'm walking with her and I'm thinking to myself, how am I gonna handle this? Because it's very possible at some point somebody's gonna say to me, you know what, Rabbi, all due respect, you don't know what you're talking about, you've offended us, and we want you to just stop. And if they say that to me, I'm gonna say, okay, you're right, I'm wrong, you're right, I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop. And I have no problem making that uh, concession. And uh, that's what I'm going to do. That's the decision I made. Walking, walking down the steps. The social hall was in the basement. I said, if anyone says that we're offended, we want you to stop, I'm just going to apologize and say, okay, you're right, I'm wrong, and I'm done. I'm stop it. By the way, that was what I told myself when I was walking down the steps to that event. I did not make any such arrangement with myself as I was coming to this event. So if you are offended, I'm still not going to stop. But I'm walking now down the steps, and I, re and I realize, hold on a second. Yeah, I have a friend named Father Tom. Um, no, he's not my father. He's, uh, he's a Jesuit priest, and uh, I call him Tom, but it's Father Tom. He's a sweet guy, and he actually, he just emailed me the other day. He emailed me on Rosh Hashanah. And it's okay, he's not Jewish, he can send me emails on Rosh Hashanah. And he wrote me a Lashana Tova email, he's a sweet guy, he's a friend of mine. But I remember Father Tom told me, he said, Chase, you have to know something. You and I are walking ink block tests. You know the Rorschach, the ink block test? He says, when people see you, they don't see you, they can't see you. They, whatever their feelings about religion are, they're going to apply that to you, they're going to project that on you. So you're not you, just remember that you're not you. So as I'm walking down the stairs and I'm walking into the double doors into the social hall, it occurs to me, I have no problem on a personal level if they tell me you're stupid, you're offending us, stop. And I'll say, okay, fine, no problem, I'm stopping. But that's not going to happen. They're not going to just leave it as, an, as a personal thing. They're going to generalize that about Judaism, about Torah, about our tradition. I'm not really in a place to allow that to happen. Okay, I don't mind my personal honor being affronted, that's fine, but what I represent. But at this point, I'm walking through the double doors, so when the, what am I gonna come up with? So I thought about running, I thought about, what, what am I gonna come up with? So this is what I came up with. I'm literally now 10 feet away from the podium, and I think to myself, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm, I'm just gonna totally make something up. And the strategy being that if anybody says, this is offensive, this is stupid, I want you to stop. I'll stop and then I'll say, by the way, I just want you to know, I totally just made that up. <laughs> so of course it's silly. It's just something I made up and don't generalize or extrapolate or apply that upon your impressions about Judaism, okay? It's nothing, it's not from Torah, it's something I made up. But that was my point, and I make something up. So I get up there and I say, uh, I was thinking the other day. That part so far was true because I had been thinking the day prior to <laughs> that lecture. I said I was thinking the other day about French New Wave cinema. And about how these guys, they didn't just make movies, they liked to discuss movies what makes a good movie, and the idea of the auteur, the film author, the singular unique vision of the director, producer, writer. And they were sitting around one time, these Nouvelle Vague film authors, and they were discussing who's the greatest director of all time. And they asked Francois Truffaut, and he said, no problem, hands down, easy answer, greatest director of all time is Alfred Hitchcock. And the other French guys said to Truffaut, that's okay, Francois, but you have to defend that premise. You have to explain why you regard Alfred Hitchcock as being the greatest director of all time. So Truffaut says, no problem, I will tell you why. It is because in his entire body of work, all of his dozens of films, there's not one single superfluous shot. <clears throat> that if Hitchcock put it on the screen for even a second, if it was there, no matter how uh, momentarily, 
if it was even there as a seemingly insignificant detail. Hitchcock had that much of an eye for the nuances, the details of everything on the screen that it was all meaningful, that all had, it was all orchestrated. And there wasn't a second, there wasn't, it was all exactly the way that it was supposed to be. That's, that's what makes him a great. So this is what I'm saying at Gilda's Club. And I say to them, you know, I was thinking, being that God created Alfred Hitchcock, could I say as much for God and the movie of my life that he's showing me as Truffaut said about Hitchcock and the movies that he made? Could I say that God has managed to show me a life, a story, a movie about me, to me, and that there's not one single superfluous shot, that no detail is meaningless, that every encounter, no matter how brief and seemingly meaningless, even if it was so fleeting, and passing, but it was all meaningful. It had to be that way. I'm stepping off the elevator and, and I didn't make eye contact for half a second with a stranger, and, and it had to be that way. It could have been another way. It wasn't that way. The director chose for it to be that way. You know, I, 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 I get to the airport and then I, I get to the rental car and, and they give me a rental car and it's a red Ford Focus with Massachusetts plates. Okay, so it couldn't have been a green Ford Focus with, with Connecticut plates. You understand? The, there's no detail that's just, like we say, stop, just random. It, the director is directing meticulously. Can I say that about God in the movie of my life that he is showing me, about me, to me? And I said, yeah, you know what? Logically, I could argue that I could say even more for God than what Truffaut said for Hitchcock. Because God has, well, think about it, he's got an unlimited budget. <laughs> he has no studio executives breathing down his neck. A cast of billions, literally. He has a fantastic art department. <laughs> have you seen some of the scenery? It's incredibly lifelike. <laughs> Yes, I believe that God could manage to make a life, a story, a movie about me that he's showing to me and every single nuance is meaningful and necessary. And you know what? Like a narrative, not every detail is pretty. Not every moment is pleasurable. But that's the nature of a story, isn't it? That's what a story is. A good story is not all good times. I was at a shiva house, and I heard this lady say, ugh. By the way, in a shiva house, a lot of sentences begin with the word, ugh. So she says, ugh, he had such a bad life. And I said, why do you say that? She said, the hardship, the loss, the adversity. I said, that's not a bad life, that's a difficult life. Bad life would be someone had all the opportunities, the resources, the talents, the opportunities, whatever it is, and he squandered it, he sat on the couch, he never loved anyone, he never did anything for anybody, that's a bad life. To say he had loss, he had adversity, challenge, that's not a bad life, that's a difficult life. And it, it struck me, we use totally different criteria to describe a good story than we do to describe a good life. When we talk about a good life, we make an easy life. When we talk about a good story, what's a good story? Imagine a good story that would be a good story but the type of good that we think is a good life. Imagine you're reading a novel. You pick up a novel and you figure out who the protagonist is, you know something right away. This is the guy who's taking a beating. Okay, the bad guy's coming after him. He's the one who's going to have the problem. And it's going to look at some point like he's down for the count. There's no coming back. And then somehow he fixes the problem. And then he becomes a man. You know, the character arc. So he fixes the problem. The conflict is resolved. And in fixing the conflict around him, then this also heals that fatal flaw within him and he becomes the person he was meant to be, or the woman she was meant to be. You know that's, that's the formula, that's the structure of a good story. But imagine you were reading a novel that would conform to our criteria of a good life, you know? You start reading, it says the protagonist woke up at 7 a.m. this morning, exactly at the time that he had set his alarm. <laughs> he went to the kitchen to get breakfast. He went to get orange juice from the refrigerator. 
There was plenty left there for a full glass. Nobody had just put the carton back with a drop left in it. <laughs> he went to go start his car. This is for my uh, great net friends, not for people who have been in Palm Beach for too long. He went to go start his car in the middle of December, and it started on the first try. You guys remember that? Snowbirds, remember that? And in the winter, that like. That, like that roulette feeling of like starting. Yeah! Okay, all right, so he went to start the car and it started at the first try. He drove to work, he made every green light, there was no bad traffic, he was 15 minutes early for work. He got to his desk, there was no extra paperwork waiting for him to be placed there by his boss. There were no complaints, no weird voicemails waiting for him. Everything was uneventful until 11, 12 a.m. when he broke early for lunch. He had a tuna fish sandwich and a pickle. It was tasty. <laughs> like, oh, come on, when does this story get good? What do you know when does it get good? This is good. good story has ups and downs and tension and conflict and sometimes if it's a really good story it even looks like there's no way to overcome the conflict. That's a really good story. But suddenly when it comes to a life, no, 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 God, don't make it interesting. Make it easy. Make it boring. So this is what I was talking about at Gilda's Club. I was saying, you know, God is telling me a story about me, and he's telling it to me, and, and every detail is significant, and not every detail is pleasant. You know, there's a difference between pleasant and painful are not synonymous or analogous, rather, to good and bad. I know when we're little kids, we think, Pleasant, painful is the same as, you know, like in the SAT, the analogies. Pleasant is too painful, as good as too bad. It's not correct. It's not. There's plenty of good things that are painful. Childbirth. Okay? There are painful things that are good. And there's pleasant things that are bad. Like candy corn. <laughs> That is remarkable maturity. You become an adult when you realize you don't even enjoy candy corn. It just makes you nauseous. It's only going to make you nauseous. Okay, so, by the way, this is an aside, but um, you know the difference between pain and suffering? Pain is not suffering. Pain is a stimulus response, it's a physiological thing. It's kind of unavoidable, it's a survival mechanism. If you didn't have pain, you wouldn't keep yourself out of trouble. You touch the hot stove, you say, ow. So pain is healthy, there's nothing neurotic about it. Suffering is the cerebral interpretation when you go into your head and you interpret the pain and then you give yourself a victim role based on the pain. You understand what I'm saying? No, it's too, uh, too wordy? Okay, I'll illustrate. Three in the morning, you get up to go to the bathroom, and you're walking down the carpeted hallway from your bath bedroom to your bathroom, and it's three in the morning, you were taking those big, plodding, heavy steps, those Frankenstein steps at three in the morning. And as you're walking, this is, you have small kids in the house, and your kid didn't clean up his Legos, at three in the morning, full force, a big heavy step on the shag carpet with the little Lego in, in between the fibers of the carpet. You come right down on it, and you become aware. See, there's that quarter of a second when your brain tells you, get ready, there's nothing you can do about this, this is gonna hurt like hell. Just get ready, there's nothing you can do. And you wait, oh yeah, this is good. And then, this searing pain goes shooting from the heel of your foot up to the base of your skull and back down again. And you feel that white hot flame in your body and you say, ow! That's pain. 
Okay? Nothing neurotic about that. That's just a stimulus response, just a survival mechanism. It's automatic. Now, a second after that happens, you bury your face in your hands and you say, why does stuff like this keep happening to me? <laughs> that is suffering. But then, you know, the more you prolong it, because, you know, by the way, if you're Jewish and you like a bargain, one moment of pain, you could milk it for a lifetime of suffering. <laughs> the more you interpret the pain, you could go on it. Those Legos, I bought those Legos. You know how ironic that is? I go out, I work, I pay for the Legos, I give them to 